Part 4 Disconnect Between the Soviet Elite and Regular Citizens During his years in foreign counterintelligence, Kalugin's view of the world pointed outward, away from the Soviet Union. But as his assignment in domestic security in Leningrad dragged on, he came face to face with uncomfortable realities about the KGB and the Communist Party. He came to realize how disconnected the elite were from regular citizens. This reality was starkly demonstrated by two of Leningrad's top officials, the mayor, Lev Zykov, and the first secretary of the Communist Party in Leningrad, Grigory Romanov. Throughout the vast expanse of the Soviet Union, a country that sprawled across 11 time zones and comprised one-sixth of the Earth's land surface, there were several hundred other little dictators like Romanov. Men who lived like Soviet pashas, grabbing the best apartments, the best food, the best women, the best hunting lands, all while espousing the glories of an egalitarian society. Of Romanov's lifestyle, Kalugin wrote, His high living, womanizing, and boozing were legendary. In order to carry out his many trysts, Romanov had two apartments, in addition to the one he shared with his wife, as well as a suite at the party hotel. He had three government cars to squire around his girlfriends. As for Let Zaykov, prior to his political career, he'd been a manager at a large defense factory. When he was promoted in the Communist Party, Kalugin's boss, Chief Daniel Nozirev, directed a subordinate to destroy the ample KGB files on Zaykov's misconduct at the factory. Now that Lev Nikolaevich Zaykov has been elected party secretary, gather everything you have about his activities at this plant and destroy it. You have damaging information. Yes, well, destroy the files at once. One of Zaykov's quirks was his fury at being passed by other motorists on the roads around Leningrad. One day, as I was riding from work to my dacha, I saw a Chaika limousine in front of me, poking along at about 40 miles per hour. My driver casually passed the capital Chaika. A few seconds later, the Chaika roared by us, its siren wailing, and someone in the back seat shaking his fist at us from the curtained window. Within a couple of days, Kalugin's boss called a meeting and made an announcement. From this day on, it is strictly forbidden for anyone to pass the cars of top officials of the regional Communist Party. Those who do it again will be severely punished. The disconnect of Soviet leaders is poignantly illustrated by Kalugin's account of touring collective farms that were ubiquitous throughout the Soviet Union. Many of our villages looked straight out of the 19th century, with people living in ramshackle wooden cottages that lacked running water and indoor toilets. But Romanov and other exalted guests never saw that reality. They invariably were squired around the handful of model collective farms that were well-run and well-funded. Smiling collective farm workers would tell the dignitary how great everything was, and then all the top local officials, party bosses, KGB chiefs, collective farm directors, would repair to a private dining room. There, the group would sit down at tables groaning with food and drink, and the marathon toasting and vodka guzzling would begin. After a few hours, everyone would be utterly smashed. Disconnect Russian Federation When considering the disconnect between elite Russians and regular citizens, it's necessary to look beyond the prosperity and privileges that come with being close to Vladimir Putin and his government. While many have amassed staggering fortunes, a more telling sign of the disconnect is the contempt of Putin's government towards Russian citizens. Contempt will be defined as having an extreme lack of respect for an individual or group, who may then be seen as unworthy of the same rights, freedoms, and protection. The following examples demonstrate the profound contempt of Vladimir Putin's government towards the Russian people. Putin's government tells constant, blatant lies. The constant use of obvious lies by Putin and his administration suggests both Putin's low opinion of the Russian public's intelligence and an impulse to destabilize their sense of reality. The following are some of his most obvious lies in the past decade. The state over whose territory this happened bears responsibility for this terrible tragedy. In July 2014, Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 was shot down over eastern Ukraine, killing all 283 passengers and 15 crew members. In a meeting with advisors, Vladimir Putin blamed Ukraine for the downing of the aircraft. In 2016, a joint investigation led by the Dutch Safety Board determined that a BUK surface-to-air missile from the Russian Federation's 53rd Anti-Aircraft Missile Brigade had downed the airliner. 
Russia is not a threat to any country. That statement was released in December 2021. On February 24, 2022, Vladimir Putin ordered a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The same day, Putin made the following statement in a national address. It is not our plan to occupy the Ukrainian territory. On September 30, 2022, Russia announced the annexation of the Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk, and Zaporizhia oblasts in Ukraine. Putin's government creates scapegoats. Another sign of the contempt of Putin's government is the use of scapegoats to manipulate Russian citizens. By doing so, they deflect the frustration and discontent of their population onto individuals and groups that the mainstream may not share a lot of common ground with. By establishing boundaries that separate desirables from undesirables, autocrats play on the worst impulses of human nature and turn people against each other. Using the foreign agent law of 2012, Putin accuses Russians who oppose him of succumbing to the corrupting influences of the West. By casting these citizens as weak and unpatriotic, Putin communicates the expectation that Russians will obey him without question. Appealing to nationalism, Putin and his government often target the large populations of migrant workers in Russia. By doing so, Putin shifts the blame for economic downturns and lapses in public order onto perceived outsiders. Citing protection of traditional family values, Putin's government continues its persecution of marginalized sexualities and gender identities. Restrictive laws and failure to protect individuals from inhumane treatment further stigmatizes these groups. Putin's government does not care about the lives and well-being of Russian citizens. Vladimir Putin's justifications for his war in Ukraine include defending traditional and family values. However, the actions of Putin's government tell a different story. The Russian government does not protect Russian men. After almost two years of war, U.S. intelligence reported that about 300,000 Russian troops have been injured or killed in Ukraine. In December 2023, Vladimir Putin announced that 600,000 Russians are currently serving there. Based on these statistics, close to a million Russian troops have been sent to Ukraine since 2022. As a further sign of Putin's low respect for Russian service members, at the outbreak of the invasion, many troops were not even informed that they were going to war. Now, as troop numbers are reaching critical levels, wounded soldiers are routinely sent back to the front line without proper medical treatment. Russians killed in action are often left behind instead of being returned to their families to reduce the official casualty count. The Russian government does not protect Russian women, children, or the elderly. In 2017, the Russian government decriminalized incidents of domestic abuse that do not require hospital treatment. This left the primary targets of domestic violence, women, children, and the elderly, dangerously vulnerable. 10% of worldwide domestic violence fatalities come from a country with only 2% of the world's population. By 2019, more than 70% of Russians favored more protection for their citizens. A bill introduced at the State Duma to recriminalize domestic violence failed after strong opposition from the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian government does not protect Russian homes. As part of a highly publicized effort to move Russians out of substandard housing, the Russian government announced it will move 36 million families into new homes by 2030. According to Statista.com, there are about 55 million households in Russia, meaning that 65% of the Russian population currently lives in substandard housing. With persistent labor shortages, inflation, and high interest rates, the government's housing goal sounds like an empty promise.